Well, good morning. Good Sabbath. Good Sabbath. Good. Welcome you all here again, including those joining us online this morning. Um, this morning I'm giving uh, the title of the message, called, it's called Soul Searching Saturday. So uh, it came to me because this Thursday was what? Thanksgiving, a day where we devote ourselves to saying thanks for all the things in our lives that was set aside uh, as a national holiday to give thanks to God for all the things we have. And then what do we do the very next day? Black Friday, where we go and beat up everybody for the stuff we want. It's kind of ironic. So this Saturday, many people are doing some soul searching for how they behaved yesterday. So uh, that's where we took off this, this week uh, for the message. Um, you see, we, we tend to never be satisfied as humans, right? We, we always look at the next shiny thing. And I think there is no bigger epitome of that in our nation than Black Friday. Good intentions, we're out there to get the best deals, that's a good thing, it's commendable to, to make your money work for you, but to get in a fist fight over a toy, and it happens every single year, I mean, right, you, you can't turn on the news Friday night or Saturday morning and not see something that went bad on Black Friday. Now, I will say, last night, I, I counted on horrible things happening yesterday, and uh I was pleasantly surprised that I can only find two articles. So things have died off a little bit with online shopping. But uh, I found this one uh, from a Walmart in California where dozens of people broke out into a Black Friday brawl over, uh, it was, this one was over toys. Uh, they ran out of toys and people went berserk and they started fighting. I don't know what brings you to the point where you got to punch somebody over a toy, but it happened. And then in where I live, in Kentucky, in Louisville, uh, the other thing that happened was a employee got hit with a rack, a display rack, because they ran out of TVs. I mean, if that doesn't speak to the hearts of people, right, saved or unsaved, we can easily fall into this covetous nature that so exemplifies the human heart. So... <clears throat> As we go through the text this morning, I want you to keep in mind what we just went through this week. We said thanks, then we went and brawled in the stores. And so this morning, I'm taking you guys to Ecclesiastes. It may not be a book you're familiar with. Um, it's in the Old Testament. It's toward the front. So if you're in your Bible, split it in the middle and then go to the left, and you're going to run into it. Uh, Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 11. I also have it up here on the screen, if you'd like to follow along up here. So, um, what... Now, commentators have disagreed who wrote this. Traditionally, we've assumed that it was King Solomon who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Some people feel that it was written uh, uh, like 600 years later. But regardless, it's written through the lens of his life. It's written, whether it was by somebody else or him... It's written from his perspective, and it's taking his life as the filter through which the message is given. Um, so let's go ahead and pick up in verse 1 of chapter 2. It says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure, enjoy yourself. But behold, this was also vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom. And how to lay hold of folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under the heaven, under heaven during the few days of their lives. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female servants. I had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the children of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my, from my heart no pleasure, 
for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, the toil I had expanded, expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. And then we're going to skip ahead to the end of the chapter. Uh, we're going to go to verse 24. This is kind of the conclusion that he reaches at the end of the chapter after, after his delve into uh, first wisdom, then pleasure, now toil. And this is his conclusion at the end of that. It says, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. This is also vanity and a striving after the wind. Now we're going to go ahead and turn to Luke 12. 13 through 21. And we're dropping into Jesus, and people have come to him here in this chapter. And it says, Someone in the crowd said to him, to Jesus, while he was teaching, and said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care and be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store all my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and I'll build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So, we have Solomon saying, Look, I tried everything there is for people to do. I poured myself into wisdom. I learned. I was educated. I did all that. And it was fruitless. Nothing came of it. Whether I was wise or whether you're not, we all end in the same place. We all die. And he said, so I poured myself into things, into pleasure, into entertainment, into stuff, into gold, wealth. I gathered it all. But in the end... I spent my entire life gathering it only to leave it to somebody else because there's no U-Haul trucks to heaven, right? And then he said, so I poured myself into my work. Maybe at least I can leave something behind from what I did with my life, from the, the things that I invested myself into. But even that, the next person comes along and wipes it all out. The next king can undo everything the king before him did. That is also worthless, chasing the wind. I love the way he puts that, chasing the wind. It's like vapor slipping through your fingers as you grasp at it. So, and then Jesus says, the accumulation of stuff is not the measure of one's life, right? It's the same teaching, put in a different way. We can spend our entire life chasing things, stuff, accumulating things. But none of it matters in the end because you can't take it with you. The things we do here a hundred years from now will fade away. For most of us, will not be remembered by history. The only thing that matters is God. There is no satisfaction in life without God. Everything else is chasing the wind. It's grasping at vapor. So what is the driving factor for us? Even as believers, it's easy for us to fall right into that. Whether that's investing ourselves into work, chasing stuff, Pleasure, entertainment, it doesn't matter. Education even, right? Now, is, are those things bad? I don't think so. But there's an underlying problem underneath all of that. And Pastor Shea brought it up last week. It's, it's a lack of thankfulness that drives the behavior. It's that covetousness in our hearts. 
So first, we have to identify where the lack of thanks is at in our life. I'll give you a hint. It's probably where you're complaining the most about things. Man, my car is so horrible. I wish I just had that one over there, right? Man, my TV just isn't big enough. I don't have a good enough house. I don't have this. I need to get that job and then life will be great. The grass is greener syndrome, right? So wherever you think the grass is greener, that's probably where you're not having a lot of thanks in your life. Even Colorado. (laughs) You know, it's funny you bring that up because for me, I I spent years, as I've shared with you, thinking, man, if I can just get back to Colorado, God's going to make everything great. But the reality is, is until I learned to say, God, what are you teaching me now here? So in Lexington, there was a very clear purpose for us to be in Lexington and for us to be in Pikeville. And that's God's timetable. He took us there, whether I wanted to or not, I was going down that road. My choice was to be miserable in it or find the the reason to be thankful for why I'm there. And that's what we need to do. When you're in the midst of the storm, what can we thank God for? Even if it is as simple as what Pastor Shea shared in his illustration last week, Thank God that not every day is like today, right? Even if it's that simple or that God is seeing me through this. See, when we, when we focus on thanking God rather than the situation, it reframes our perspective. We need to find ways to be thankful for how God is working in the midst of that to give us the correct perspective. The second thing that we need to do is hold loosely to our things, right? So Jesus, when he's talking uh, in the parable, he's talking about this guy who hoarded all this stuff and he had so much stuff, suddenly his property won't hold it. His solution wasn't to to give some of it away, to help some people. He didn't even consider that. The, the, The most logical thing to him was, well, let's knock down the buildings and build bigger ones so I can keep all the stuff, right? That's not what we're taught to do. And, it, and when we do that, we're beholden to our things instead of focusing on God. So if we hold loosely to our things, we're going to give first to God before anything else. That's the principles we see in scripture, right? First fruits, right? So if we go to Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, uh, that, that shows us we intentionally honor God with what we have been given. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats bursting with wine. When we honor God, we may get more stuff, but we're going to not care as much about the stuff as much as about honoring God, right? Uh, The second part of holding loosely is be willing to part with your stuff, right? As Jesus so aptly put in the parable, you can't take it with you. You're going to leave it to somebody else. All the stuff you're accumulating is going to be left behind regardless of what you do. So be willing to let go of it. It's also the same principle he told the rich young man who came to him and said, I've done all the things of the law. What else must I do? And Jesus said, go give away all your stuff to the poor. Follow me. The principle wasn't the stuff. It's your heart. Are you beholden to the stuff? Let go of it. I will give you stuff when it's right, right? And then, and then we can look at Paul also in Philippians 4.11 through 13, which 4.13 is like the most out of context verse taken all the time. What he's talking about is learning to live in abundance and in need, right? We need to learn to live when we have plenty and when we have nothing focused on God. That's part of holding loosely to things. And, it, and that, those verses say, not that I'm speaking of being in need. So he's, he's saying to them, I'm not asking for stuff, right? When he's writing this, he says, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all of that because God's got me. God's got it. I find it interesting that in Matthew 19 that we read out of, or I'm sorry, Luke 12, the very very next thing is have anxiety about nothing. It's that teaching that don't worry about where your food's coming from. The birds of the field, don't worry about it. God's got you. That's the principle we need. We need to hold loosely to things. Things will come to us and they will go. But God is what's important. And then the last thing we need to do 
to overcome our covetousness hearts is to remember that this world is not our final destination. This is not home. See, we're ambassadors of Christ living in foreign lands. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 10 tells us that. That we're here on loan to tell the world about Jesus, right? Our citizenship is in heaven. That's the second thing. We are, we are citizens of heaven today, right now. Not living in heaven. We're living here on earth to be witnesses for God. That's the last half of 2 Corinthians 5. It talks about you are already citizens here in heaven. You're just not here yet. But you already possess the citizenship here. So when we do those three things, it gives us the right perspective. You see, pleasure, wisdom, toil, whatever we strive after, none of those things are really the problem. It's not the things. It's not the, it's, education isn't bad. Work is not bad. It's actually good. Eating food and having merriment, entertainment, that's not bad things, right? It's why the teacher at the end of Ecclesiastes, the preacher as he's called, or Solomon, uh, he says there's nothing else to do but enjoy what we have with the time that we have. It's not a bad thing. God's given those things to us. Those things can be good, right? But for 1 Corinthians 10, 31, which we talked about not long ago, so whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. You see, the problem is not the stuff. It's our hearts. Our hearts are wayward. We get consumed with the stuff rather than glorifying God with what we have. With being thankful for where we, what we have. So if we don't guard our hearts, if we're not intentional about how we're living our lives, we can easily fall right back into the same patterns that the non-believer does. And we're left in the rat race of life, chasing after the wind. I don't know about how many of you, but I've gotten the car that I wanted. It was not as fulfilling as I thought it was going to be. I've gotten that game that I had to have when I was a kid, and it was not as cool as I thought. You know, I get two weeks later, I'm looking at the next thing. It's easy to fall into that, even if we're a believer. You've got to guard yourself against it. We have to address the covetousness in our hearts. We have to find contentment and satisfaction where we're at right now. It's not to say we don't work hard. We work hard for God. At our job, we work as hard as we can, the best that we can, to bring glory to God. We enjoy the stuff that we have to the glory of God. God's given us stuff. It's okay to enjoy what we have. It's okay to even want that car. As long as it doesn't become that obsessive, I need it to find fulfillment in my life. And we have to be willing to say, I can lose my car tomorrow and that's okay too. Right? Or my job or, or, or school or whatever it is, right? Whatever those things that we prize so highly in our life. Maybe even with good intentions. They can, they can really derail us. And we need to glorify the creator and long for him rather than try to satisfy the cravings of our heart with stuff, with fame, with career, with education, right? Because he's the only true source of our contentment. That's the teaching from these passages this morning. There is no satisfaction without God in anything. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, Father God, Lord, we want to be good servants for you. Lord, we desire you, but we are so easily distracted, so easily taken off track. God, we need your help. Lord, we're grateful that you have sacrificed to bring us back to you. Lord, help us to sacrifice in the same manner to honor you. Lord, help us to, to be able to honor you in plenty and in need. God, help us to be faithful witnesses for you so people look at us and say, what do they have? Why are they content and I'm not? 
God, our purpose is to be your witnesses, your faithful image bearers here on earth. Help us to do that well. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.